Google Cloud AI Developer Relations. My name is Andrew Frillich, and I'm a staff member at Google Cloud Developer Relations. This particular presentation is our first part in our primer on deep learning. The audience for this are those who are um, new to deep learning. Um, but have some background or from at least some familiarity with the concepts, basic concepts behind machine learning and are familiar with the Python programming language. We'll also be using TensorFlow 2.0 or more particularly 2x throughout this presentation. At the end of the presentation is also a follow-up workshop. So for those who do choose to do the workshop afterwards, you can, they come as a notebook and you can either run them in CoLab or run them locally on your own laptop. In the latter case, you'll have to have installed on your laptop TensorFlow, NumPy, and Python OpenCV. But let's go ahead and now just sort of jump right in to our neural networks. So we're going to be using TensorFlow Keras throughout uh, this virtual training. And in TensorFlow 2.0, they married Keras together, which really brought object-oriented programming to TensorFlow. And that changed things in a way, or brought strengths that included imperative programming, which is really how software programmers program today. At the object-oriented programming brought in abstraction and polymorphism, and with that, design patterns, which will give you quick creation of models. And finally, dynamic graph execution, which allowed models to be debugged at runtime. So the very first thing to think about in a neural network is the input layer. This is where your input comes into the model. And neural networks take numbers. And these numbers can come as either a vector, a matrix, or a tensor. So a vector is simply a one-dimensional array, like a list of numbers. A matrix is a two-dimensional array, like pixels in a black and white image. And a tensor is simply any array that's three dimensions or more. The first object I'm going to discuss is the input class. This is the item that, that holds the input into the model, both when you're training it and later when you're doing predictions. So in our case, we're going to, from TensorFlow Keras, we're going to import the input class. And we're going to instantiate an input object and specify its shape. In this case, I'm going to say its shape is a 1D vector of 13 elements. Now, for example, let's assume we're using this on a housing model. And we want to predict the price of a house. And we might have um, features. Uh, those are our elements, such as the square footage of the house, the size of the lot. Um, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, how much was paid in property tax. All of those are numbers. And assuming we have 13 different features, that would be our input object. Now, if we executed that and then printed what that would look like, this is what would be outputted. It would tell us it's a tensor. Um, this is just a default name that's given to it. Its data type would be a float32. And then this is the shape. And this question mark might be a little puzzling at first. Well, models don't take necessarily a single um, example. They tend to take batches, particularly during training. You train your model in batches of examples. But you don't know until training how big that batch is. And so this question mark is just a placeholder for the size of the batch. Now, what is meant by deep? Um, really, until deep learning, the early neural networks were really two layers. They had an input layer and an output layer. And the moment we started adding layers in between, that's what deep means. It just simply means there's one or more layers between the input layer and the output layer. And for our purposes, modern neural networks, every layer is fully connected to every other layer. And that means that every node in this layer is connected to every node in this layer, and so forth and so forth. So sometimes people are a little confused also by the word hidden. Um, 
in the case of hidden, it really just think of it like a function. Um, you, the parameters of the function are the input layer, the result from the function are the output layer, and the code inside the black box is the hidden layer. So here we'll also talk about the number of connections in a neural network. So as I pointed out, every layer is fully connected to every other layer. So in this example, I have an input layer of three nodes, and then I have a hidden layer of four nodes. So this node here is connected every node there, this node is connected every node there, and so forth. So really we have three times four um, connections for a total of 12 connections. And the reason this is important, you'll see uh, soon, is every one of these connections has a weight. Or, or what you might call a parameter. And it's those parameters or weights that we're going to learn during training. And the more weights we have, the more we can learn, but the more computational complex the model is, and the more time it's going to take to train it. So these types of models are also known as feed forward. That is, we take our input data, we feed it, to at the input layer and we move forward through the model and output out the output layer. And there in, in TensorFlow Keras, there are two distinctive ways of coding a feed forward network. And we're gonna cover both of them. Um, one is a sequential API method and the other is a functional API method. We start people with the sequential API because it's really simple to understand and get going. But when you get into coding models for real in the real world, you quickly move to the functional API just because of its increased expressiveness, particularly in being able to do things that are conditional or not necessarily even uh, sequentially feed forward. So I'll start here with the sequential API. So we'll start off from the TensorFlow Keras module. We're going to import the sequential object. And when we instantiate it, we just created a model, an empty model. It has no layers. This method has a, this object has a method called add, and that allows you to sequentially add layers. So every time I issue an add, that's the next layer in the model in the sequential order I issued the add. So hypothetically, I could have done an add of my first layer, an add of my next layer, and then finally an add of my output layer. There are other ways of writing this. I could have specified my layers at the time I instantiated the sequential object. All I have to do is give it a list and then just give the order of the layers in the list. So there's my first layer, second layer, third layer. So this code sequence here is identical to this code sequence here. Now, the functional API approach is different. You build your layers first, you say how to bind them, and then you, at the very end, you pull it all together or tie it all together. And in this case, it actually you takes advantage of polymorphism, which I'll explain in a moment. But here we'll start off with two different things. First, we're going to import the model class instead of the sequential class. And then from Keras layers, we're going to import the layers class. So we're going to start off by first creating a layer. So we create our input layers. And hypothetically, this just represents whatever that layer would be. Then we're going to create the next layer, our hidden layers. But you notice that after I instantiate this object, I'm calling it like a function. That is, because um, Keras supports polymorphism, when you instantiate a, front, a, a layer is also callable. And when you call it, you specify the layer you want to bind it to. So I'm going to specify here that I want to bind it to the input layer. Then I'm going to instantiate an output layer, and I'm going to call it. And in that callable, I'm going to specify the layer I want to bind it to. I'm going to bind it to the hidden layer. And then finally, I'm going to instantiate the model object. 
And when you do it, you give it two parameters. The input, what was the input? And the output. And what it does is it follows all those bindings you specified and it builds the model for you. So this code here, as the functional API, is identical to these examples before using the sequential API. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the input shape versus the input layer. And this sometimes is confusing to people. They're not the same thing. The input shape is the size of those examples that you're going to feed to your neural network during training or during prediction. For example, like that housing example I gave where you had 13 elements, 13 features, your input shape was a 1D vector of size 13. The input layer, on the other hand, is just simply the number of nodes on that first layer, and it does not have to match that of the input vector. But what's important to remember is that every element in the input vector will be fully connected to every node on the input layer. So again, using that 13 element input vector case, assuming we had an input layer of 10 nodes, we would have 130 connections, 10 times 13, between the input vector and the input layer. So the next thing to introduce is the dense layer. So a dense layer is um, really the most basic type of layer in a model. In a fully connected, uh, a <laughs> fully connected uh, neural network, a dense layer is defined as having n number of nodes. And they're going to be fully connected to the previous nodes. So let's go ahead and, and uh, code um, a, a simple neural network using the sequential method. Our input layer will be 10 nodes. We're going to take an input vector of a 13 element, um, which will be our 13 features. We're going to connect it to a second or our hidden layer of 10 nodes. And finally, we're going to connect it to an output layer of just one node. Now, when we use just one node in the output layer, we generally refer to this as a regressor. And that means that our neural network will output a single real number. So let's go ahead and start coding that in the sequential method. So here again, I'm going to import the sequential object. But then from layers, I'm going to import the dense layer. So let's start. So I instantiate a sequential object here. So I have a model on an empty model. I'm going to add my first layer. If you notice here, I'm going to instantiate a dense object. So that's the dense layer. And the parameter to it, the first parameter, is the number of nodes. So I have 10 nodes. Because this is the very first layer, I'm going to have to specify this keyword argument, the input shape. What is the input shape to the very first layer? And that first layer, using our example, the housing example, is a 13 element 1D vector. I'm then going to specify my hidden layer, the second layer of 10 nodes. And finally, I'm going to specify my last layer of one node. Now, again, I could write that all as a, as a list during the time I instantiate the sequential object. So here's my list. Here's my first layer, my second layer, my third layer. So this code sequence is identical to this code sequence. So let's now do this, repeat this again, but this time do it with the functional API. So in the functional API, I'm going to want to import both the input class and the model class. And the first thing I'm going to do is create the input object separately from the model. So here I am, I'm instantiating the input object and I'm specifying its shape as 13. Now, sometimes people get confused by this comma here. Why is this here? Well, if we didn't have the comma, this would just look like a numerical expression that evaluates to 13. It's really a Python nuance. This just tells Python this is really a tuple that is size 1D. Okay, now that I've defined 
the input object, I want to define the input layer. So I'm going to instantiate a dense object of 10 nodes, and then I'm going to invoke it as a callable. And the parameter to it is the layer I want to bind it to. In this case, I want to bind it to the input vector. So let's kind of write this in full. So starting from the beginning again, I instantiated my input object. I create my first layer. I bind it to the input object. I create my hidden layer of 10 nodes, and I'm going to bind it to the input layer. Then I'm going to create my output layer and bind it to the hidden layer. And then finally, I'm going to instantiate my model, specifying the beginning, the inputs, and the ending, the output. And it's going to follow all those bindings and build the model. So the next thing to talk about are activations. So over time, it was found that neural networks work better that at any one layer, you're, you're sending a value out. Think of that value as a signal. And in its simplicity, that signal is like saying, how strongly do I believe something is true? And what they found that you got better results in a neural network if you squash, send that signal through some kind of squashing function. And that squashing function is an activation. And those activations assist neural networks in learning faster and better. So a simple way to think about it is think of your layer as if it was a function. You got something coming in. Those are your parameters. On that layer, it's doing some kind of calculation that produces a result. That's your signal. But instead of sending that signal or result straight out is you pass it through another function, an activation function that somehow modifies or squashes that value. So I'll introduce you first to what's called the rectified linear unit. This is the most basic activation function you're going to use. Okay. And it's actually very simple. It really does just two things. For any value less than zero, it just clips it and returns zero. And any value above zero, it returns that value as is. And again, let's look at that signal problem. It's really just saying, if I have a negative value, just change it to zero, which really means no signal. So let's go ahead now and add our activation functions uh, between our layers. So going back to that earlier example, we create a sequential model here that's empty right now. We create our first layer. We specify the input shape. But now we're going to pass the output of this layer through an activation function. And then from that activation function, we go into our next layer, 10 nodes, which gets passed through an activation function. And then finally, our last layer. So let's go ahead and sort of look inside what's inside this model. So in Keras, when you make a model, the model comes with a method called summary. And the summary tells you, shows you layer by layer by layer how your model is constructed. So these are our layers. We have that input layer followed by our activation function, our hidden layer followed by activation function, and following finally our output layer. These are just default names that are given to them. Okay. Um, the next important thing is the input shape. And you notice, if you remember, our layers, first two layers were all 10 nodes each. That's that. Our output layer is a one. You might wonder, well, what's this other thing here? None. This is like when we talked about the uh, input shape being a question mark because we didn't know the batch size. This is the same thing because it doesn't take one element, it's going to take a batch, and we don't know the size of that batch. This none is just simply a placeholder for runtime. Okay, so this is the number of parameters, and you may have noticed that this isn't what we first talked about. We said the input vector is 13. This is 10. 13 times 10 is 130. So why did we get 140? Well, in neural networks, every node also has a bias, okay? And you have one bias per node. So we have 130 plus 10, that gives us 140. 
Similarly, between the input layer and the hidden layer, we would have 10 times 10 for 100 plus 10 for the bias of that layer, which gives us 110. And in total, this neural network has a total of 261 nodes. Okay, so we've already uh, discussed uh, how we calculate that and the bias. Okay, so there are shorter ways of writing this. So layers in TensorFlow Keras can all have a number of keyword parameters, and one of them is the activation function. So I could just go ahead and specify the activation function at the time I instantiate the layer. So that's what I've done here. I've said the first layer is a ReLU, and the second layer is a ReLU. So this shorter hand syntax is equivalent this longer form we wrote here. Okay. So now I put my model together and I need, and the next step is, is I need to compile it. And this is part of completing the building of the feed forward portion of your model. And what it does is it adds in the backward propagation during training. And a simple way to think of this is I'm going to feed my model during training a batch of data. And that data is going to move feed forward through the model. And the model is going to start making predictions. And in that, at the end, it's going to predict what it thinks every element, every sample in that batch is. And at the same time, I'm going to have the right answers, or sometimes called the labels, or other times called the ground truths. Okay. And at the end, I want to measure the difference between what the model thought these were, its predictions, and what they actually are. And that difference is we call the loss. And then I want to take that loss and backward propagate it through the model and update the weights in a way that the next time I run a batch through, that loss gets smaller and keep repeating it smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's sometimes referred to as minimizing the loss. And that's the job of the optimizer. So in our case, we're using a regressor. There are a number of different ways of calculating the loss. The typical way of calculating the loss in a regressor is to use um, the mean square error method, which for shorthand we can say as MSE. So let's go ahead and compile now our model for backward propagation. So we're going to set our loss to mean uh, square error. Now our optimizers in neural network are based on gradient descent. Each one is a different uh, variation of gradient descent. Generally for regressors, the most popular optimizer used is the RMS prop optimizer. Okay. So the next type of neural network I'll explain is a binary classifier. It's also known as a logistic classifier. Uh, don't get too scared by that word logistic. It just means zero or one. A binary classifier is something that's saying yes, no, true, false, zero or one. But you know on that final node, you could have any value coming through, a negative value, a positive value. What a sigmoid activation function does is that it maps all values to, to, into a range of zero or one. And very quickly, once you get a value just a little bit above zero or a little bit less than zero, it quickly moves to the extremes. And that's what we want. We want the values coming out to be at or very close to zero or at or very close to one. So, Let's go back to that same housing example, but let's say instead of predicting the value of the house, we're predicting whether we should buy the house. And so that's our yes or no decision. And we'll just make a few changes to our model. All of this stays the same, except for the output layer. We're going to change the activation function now to a sigmoid. So now the output coming out of it is not a real value like the price of the house, but it's going to be squashed between zero and one. Buy the house, one, not buy the house, zero. At the same time, we're going to change 
our loss function. And we're going to use now the what's called the binary cross entropy. So let's now write that in this functional style. So let's start off. Oh, this time I'm going to just to remind you, I'm going to import the dance, the relu, and the activation objects or classes. I'm going to instantiate my input um, a, a object, which it has a shape of a 13 element 1D vector. I create my first layer, the dense layer. I'm going to tie the input vector to the input layer. And then I'm going to specify an activation layer that's a relu. And I'm going to tie the output from our first layer through the activation function, then create the hidden layer, tying it to the activation function from the first layer, passing it through another activation function. Finally, the final dense layer, and then the output of that dense layer is now going to go through a sigmoid activation function. So the next type of neural network is a multi-class classifier. And that's just saying, I'm going to classify something of being of one or more classes. And so in this example, let's say I want to classify an age demographic, um, whether somebody is a baby, a toddler, a preteen, a teenager, or adult. So I got five classes. That's my multi-class classifier. And my inputs, we're going to say, is a set of body measurements, like the height, the weight, and let's say the nose surface area, and the gender. And we're going to predict which class it belongs to. So to do this, we're going to use, first we're going to have on the output layer, we'll have a node for every class, unlike the earlier ones where we showed you only one node. So in this case, because we have five classes, we're going to have five nodes. Now, every node is going to do an independent prediction of what it thinks this is. So one node will specialize on being the baby, and it will output a prediction how confident I am that this example is a baby. The next node might be the preteen one putting how confident am I that this is a preteen. The problem with this is each one makes an independent prediction and they don't necessarily add up to 100%. For example, it might be one node outputs 92% confident this is a toddler and another node might output 40% confident this is a baby. And the preteen one might output 2% confident that it's a preteen. What we want to do is take all those independent predictions and squash them into a new range so they all add up to zero. I mean, all add up to one for 100%. So in that example, we might come out where it says I'm 97% confident this is a toddler and only 3% confident that this is a baby. So let's go ahead and write that model. Okay, so we're going to use the sequential method. We create our empty model here. We're going to create our very first input layer. Our activation, again, is a ray loop, but this time the input shape is a, a four-element 1D vector. Um, that element is basically the um, height, weight, nose surface area, and the gender. Then we're going to add in our hidden layer of 10 nodes, and finally our output layer. And you can see we've done two things differently here. The number of nodes is five now, one for every class. The activation function is a softmax. And then in the model.compile, our last line, you can see we use the loss function, categorical cross entropy instead of binary cross entropy. And the other thing we changed was the optimizer. In general, for multi class classifiers, the best optimizer for you to use is the atom optimizer. So the next type of neural network is a multi-label, multi-class classifier. And this is when you want to output not one class, but multiple classes. Okay. So for example, let's say we don't, let's say we're going to remove from our input list the gender. 
So our input vector now is only height, weight, and nose surface area. But we want to predict coming out the age demographic and the gender. So two different labels. For example, we might want to say someone is a preteen and a female. So how could we code this? Well, one way you could code is you could just put those together. So we remember we had five age demographic classes and two um, gender. So five plus two is seven. So maybe we just make the output layer seven. Well, this really isn't going to work. Um, and I'll throw it. And then we say we take the two highest predictions. Well, the problem with this is we don't really know that the two highest predictions for certain, one will come out of the age demographic and one will come out of the gender. It could be both of them come out of the age demographic and our two highest ones are preteen and adult. So this is style isn't going to work. Instead, we're gonna to have to use this alternative design. And this is the first opportunity to show you branching and the reason you would use, well, the first reason you would use the functional API. And what we wanna do here is on the output level, we actually want to have two separate outputs or two separate dense layers. One of them is gonna be for our age demographic, which is gonna take five nodes or five classes. And the other one will be, will predict our gender of two classes. And both of them will get the output from the hidden layer, or more importantly, a copy of the same output. So let's go ahead and code this. So we start off fairly much the same, but now since we pulled out the gender, our input object is only three elements. So we create our input layer the same way, tying it to the in, uh, input vector. We create our hidden layer, tying it to the input layer. But here's where it changes. We create two output layers. We're gonna call them output one and output two. And the first one has the five nodes for our age demo, yeah, our age demographic. And our second one has two nodes for our gender. But as you can see, they both take a copy of the same output here from the hidden layer. So it's like a branch. Then when we create the model where we specify the inputs and the outputs, because we now have multiple outputs, we specify them as a list. And then finally we put it together and compile it, specifying categorical cross entropy as our loss function and Adam as our optimizer. So let's start, start um, walking into the idea of classifying images. So I am going to start with mitts. Throat's getting dry, so I have a little coffee here. Okay, this will be the only time I talk about minced. Um, MINCE is a data set for recognizing handwritten digits 0 through 9, so there's 10 digits, and it consists of grayscale images that are 28 by 28 pixels. So that's really a matrix, a 2D matrix. This is kind of hypothetically what it might look like on a smaller scale, though in reality it's 28 this way, 28 that way. And every position in it represents the pixel at that location um, in the image, and it's going to have a value between 0 and 255. And that value represents how white something is. So 0 means it's black, 255 means it's white, and any value in between is a, scray, a grayscale value. Now, in the neural networks I showed you so far, the input layer can only take a 1D vector. So we have a problem here in that our data set, our minced images are 2Ds, they're 28 by 28. So to make this work is we're gonna to need to flatten that 2D matrix into a 1D vector. And, and so this flattening, as we call it that, will convert this 28 by 28 into a 1D vector that's 784 features, that's 28 by 28. And the way we do is we just simply start with the first row. We then take the second row and we tack it on the back. We take the third row and we tack it on the back of that and so forth and so forth and so forth. 
Now, in uh, TensorFlow Keras, there is a layer to do that flattening operation. So from TensorFlow Keras layers, we're going to also include the flatten layer. So now when I create a neural network, my first layer is going to be a flatten operation. And here I specify the input shape is 28 by 28. The output of this is going to be a 1D vector of 784 elements. So in this neural network, it's a little different from the ones I've shown you. It's going to be two layers of 512, 512. And then finally, an output layer of 10 nodes using softmax. And we got 10 nodes because we have 10 digits. So let's now do a summary on that. So you see your flatten, you see your dense input layer, you see the net, the hidden dense layer, and then finally the output dense layer. So let's kind of note, look at the output shape. So when we flattened it, we changed it from 28 to 28 to 784 elements. And now our input layer is 512 nodes, which is kind of common for mints. But how many parameters do we have? 784 times 512, we already have over 400,000 parameters. And then our um, the number of parameters between our input layer and our hidden layer is 512 by 512. That gives us another quarter million. We're quickly approaching 700,000 parameters. And all of those parameters are the parameters we will need to learn during training. So the next thing I want to talk about is overfitting. So when you're training, you're going to split your data set up into training and test data. You're going to take a little bit of that data set and, and separate it and not use it in training. It's called the holdout or test data set. And the model in training never sees it. And the idea is, is after you train your model and during training, it tells you how well your model is performing on the training data. To verify that's really correct, you run it on the test data to see if you get close or the same result. Now, one thing that might happen is your model might overfit itself to the data. So one way of explaining this is we want models to generalize, not memorize. And the way models have been designed is we design them for overcapacity. That is, we, they have a lot of redundancy in it, and that allows them to uh, achieve higher and higher levels of accuracy. But all that overcapacity means that the model could actually memorize um, individual samples instead of generalize. And so when we're training, if, if as we're training and we're watching the loss calculation, and if you recall, I said earlier, the job of the optimizer is every time a batch goes through that loss, you get smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, generally what we see if we're watching is we kind of see this type of curve where we start, the loss drops sort of very quickly, and then it slows down and slows down and slows down and starts to level off in a plateau. And we call that a convergence. But if we train past this point, there's a chance our model will start memorizing the data. And while we're training, it looks like it's getting better. But when we run it on the test data, it will go the other direction. <clears throat> so we need to find uh, ways of when we're training to sort of prevent our models from overfitting. Okay, And one of those ways is called dropout. OK, or let me back up. We, we use this phrase regularization and regularization is, is a just a set of different methods that we help models not overfit during training. Or in other words, it helps them generalize instead of memorize. And the most basic type is called dropout and dropout is like forgetting. And and yeah, it, it mimics the uh, forgetting process. And so typically where it's used is it's used just before the output layer. So for example, I've added it right here. We have our input, our flatten, our input layer, then our hidden layer, and then a dropout. Okay. 
And the number you give it is a value between 0 and 1, and that's the percentage of nodes that are going to forget. And what does forget mean? Well, it just means it sets the value to 0. That is, um, output 0 or no signal. Okay, but it randomly picks them on each path. So if I set 0 0.5, I'm saying I want to randomly forget 50% of the values of these 512 nodes. But every time it goes through, it's a different random 50%. Okay, so um, that's the end of our first training. Um, in, a, in the subsequent presentation on on our neural networks for our lab exercise. I will walk you through the lab exercise. Um, I all wish you uh, good luck and thank you for attending.